the San Diego Convention Center in San Diego, California, it's the ASN Kinney Week 2015 podcast, a discussion of the latest scientific and clinical advances presented at this year's meeting. ASN thanks Opco Renal for its support of this podcast. Welcome to the third day of the ASN Kidney Week podcast. I'm Jonathan Himmelfarb, the president of the American Society of Nephrology. Hi, I'm Jula Inrig. I'm a senior medical director at Quintiles, and I'm also on the board of directors for the Kidney Health Initiative. Hi, I'm Neil Poe. I'm chief of medicine at San Francisco General Hospital and a professor at University of California, San Francisco. Hi, I'm Wolfgang Winkelmeyer. I'm the chief of the section of nephrology at Baylor College of Medicine. Well, it's been uh, a terrific meeting. What, sec- what sessions have really excited uh, everybody here uh, so far during the meeting? What have you learned that you didn't expect to learn at this meeting? I enjoyed the uh, high impact clinical trials uh, session this morning. Um, there, there was some really exciting information about a new drug that might help to slow kidney disease progression in type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's an uh, inhibitor of uh, sodium and glucose transport. And the results were dramatic, almost a 50% decrease in the renal endpoint and decreasing a GFR uh, or, end st- or increase in end-stage renal disease. Yeah, that was very impressive findings. And it's interesting because they're testing it in more broad spectrum of diabetic kidney disease, but then there's other companies that are also doing large scale trials as well right now in patients with overt proteinuria. So not only will we have this trial that tells us it delays progression to macroalbuminuria, development of end stage renal disease, so saying we should use it early on but then we will also have trials coming out in the next few years that are saying of you know of it being tested in later stage diabetic kidney disease as well. So it's very promising therapy. Interesting. Yeah, I felt like a little bit of a deja vu, you know, going back to my very early days as a physician when we looked at the early ACE inhibitor trials Mm -hmm. and found similar findings to what we saw today, which is an early deterioration in estimated GFR in the uh, the drug arm and then crossing of the curves after, you know, a year or something like that, but very, very strong long-term benefit. Yeah, this is a potentially tremendously exciting because without a doubt one of the great public health unmet needs for our field are new therapies to slow the progression of diabetic kidney disease. So obviously we'll need more trials and more rigorous testing and validation. I think it's also nice that there are a number of these SGLT2 inhibitors that are either on the market or are in development. So we'll be able to learn over time, is this a class effect? Is this related to the individual drug? Uh, And that'll be very helpful. And there's a lot to be learned about the mechanism by which uh, SGLT2 inhibition somehow seems to protect the renal tubular epithelia. So it'll give us a lot of opportunities to translationally explore both in clinical studies and at the bench. And, and we may have just stumbled upon something that would be just a tremendous benefit to our whole field. And it was extremely convincing when you look at an array of different kidney outcomes, it was completely consistent. You had a 39% reduction for new onset of worsening nephropathy. You had a 38% reduction reduction for new onset macroalbuminuria, a 44% reduction in doubling of creatinine. And if that's something you're not satisfied with, even the endpoint of incident end stage renal disease was reduced by 55% and significant in its own right. It also had a uh, major effect on uh, cardiovascular outcomes and all-cause mortality and heart failure hospitalization. Seems like a winner. Potential. We have to be a little cautious. We always have to do because we've been fooled before, but really a potential home run uh, that would just be tremendous for our field. You're absolutely right because there, there was an increase in genital urinary tract infections something that can be easily identified and treated and monitored, but your point's well taken. But it raises 
Also, again, another issue that we've seen with previous trials, which was an exclusion of patients with more advanced kidney disease. So by design, CKD4 and 5 was included from the trial. A few people with stage 4 slipped in, really. Uh, but these drugs will end up being used also in patients with more advanced kidney disease and remains to be studied, in my opinion at least, uh, what it's, uh, you know, whether to deploy it effectively and safely in that population as well. I think another encouraging finding was, was just the sheer number of clinical trials that were being reported this year. So in addition to the oral uh, late-breaking clinical trials, there were a large number this year of submitted trials, many of which were presented as posters as well. And we have a number, of many are preliminary, some are proof of concept, but a lot of uh, positive studies. We all know that small proof of concept studies sometimes don't get reproduce, but nonetheless, that's the pipeline for future investigation and potential new therapeutics in our field. So across the spectrum of kidney disease, I thought it was very encouraging at this meeting, both the depth and breadth and number of different kinds of clinical trials that we're seeing emerge in kidney disease. Yeah, I moderated a session on Thursday in trials, basically, and the number, and particularly in diabetic kidney disease, there was about three in the CCR2 antagonism space for diabetic kidney disease. Most of them were phase two, and the endpoint is is micro or is albuminuria, so it's UACR reduction. So the signal's really hard to show, and, and the effect size is very modest. But that's the signal that you agree with the FDA to show in phase two, then to move forward for phase three, to really show what you want to show, which is delay in progression to end stage renal disease and the hard outcome of of GFR. Um, but you've got a number of therapies that have been shown that, and even though the effect is modest, they seem relatively safe. Um, so hopefully we'll see there some new development in that space as well. And then some other antifibrotic. I've seen some, some studies in mouse models. There were some posters today, some really interesting antifibrotic, and they're going to have to figure out the path forward for development in that space, but some exciting stuff there too, some really novel stuff within diabetic kidney disease that we'll see in the pipeline, I think, in the next few years. Yeah, very exciting. Yes. And we saw, just as an example from another field, I, I thought it was a tour de force plenary talk from Helen Hobbs, yes. where she really used a genetic approach to identify new ways to potentially uh, slow the uh, progression of atherosclerosis. And she started out by showing the Framingham risk curves related to serum cholesterol, and showing that even though they overlapped a lot, when you got to the edges of the curves and you derived information from those edges and brought it back to the general population, even though you might look like you're only having a modest effect on the surrogate outcome, they actually had a very large effect on more hard outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is, even with these uh, chemokine antagonists, even if the phase two effect is small, there's always the potential that the clinical outcome will be magnified. We'll just have to find out. Yeah, that was a tremendous talk. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a tour de force. Mm -hmm. I also learned what didn't work, particularly in, acute, in preventing acute kidney injury. Uh, statins don't work, and they may actually increase acute kidney injury after uh, cardiac uh, bypass surgery. And uh, high-dose steroids don't seem to help at all either. I felt there was some really, um, you know, beautiful aspect to that. However, you know, I agree that it's just too bad that we keep stri stri striking out on the AKI domain. You know, steroids today, uh, by the way, I love Dr. Garg's approach in partnering with large cardiovascular trials proactively, getting the kidney sub-study in and really producing extremely top-level evidence. You know, unfortunately, every single time it's null, at least been up to now. I guess the only positive trial that we've seen recently was uh, remote ischemic preconditioning uh, half a year ago in that one trial, but you know, subsequent trials have not exactly validated that signal. But the one thing that I really found amazing is, and, and I just love that, uh, when people early in their careers, you know, funded by K23, so really junior investigators, pull off within their you know, learning years essentially large randomized trials such as the statin trial that was conducted at Vanderbilt. You know, once again, the K23 awardee who really pulls off a monumental piece of work and provides, you know, albeit negative you know, evidence, if you will, a null finding with the potential safety signal, but clearly filling a very important evidence.
evidence gap. Right, and I think we all understand that if a null trial is rigorously done uh, and it's convincing, that's beneficial to the field as well because sometimes letting some ideas go and letting us as a field move on to the more promising ideas provides an enormous amount of benefit. So I agree with you, uh, uh, really congratulations to Josh Billings uh, for doing that trial uh, almost single-handedly yeah. uh, in the uh, ICUs at uh, Vanderbilt. That was really, I thought, a tremendous accomplishment. What did you think of the uh, plenary talk from today, Jerry Shulman, who really is probing deeply into cellular mechanisms of insulin resistance and diabetes and some paradoxical relationships between obesity and diabetes and insulin resistance where uh, uh, obviously the association we know about between obesity and diabetes is there, but also he explored mechanisms in both animal models and humans where even very lean people can have insulin resistance and even diabetes because of, uh, and really because of mechanisms that comprehensively made a lot of sense. I think it was beautiful to see work that spans so many years and goes yeah. between the lab and then the human and working between the NIH. I, I, that was my take home from yeah. that and seeing him take the, that from the patient to the lab and back, that's very impressive. And to see a career that has done that, yeah. that was my take home from that lecture. Yeah, I thought that was fabulous. And, and that over the course of his career, most of his work was done in human studies. Mm -hmm. And yet with really uh, phenomenal ad adaptation of NMR techniques, methodologies to really rigorously investigate critical pathways in both the liver and the muscle for insulin resistance. The first thought I had watching this talk is why can't we do that in the kidney? Why can't we develop imaging techniques in the kidney that'll tell us about kidney metabolism and what could we learn? So maybe we can adopt some of uh, what, we, what we heard from him one day to understand the kidney, meta kidney metabolism and kidney disease as well. I think our speaker tomorrow, our young investigator, I heard yeah. him give a talk on Wednesday night because we had an AHA symposium and we had him speak on Wednesday night. He has some great imaging and I yes, think his lecture tomorrow will be quite impressive as well because his lecture that he gave on Wednesday night and the imaging that he has done is fantastic. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to both the young investigator uh, talk tomorrow and the plenary lecture tomorrow and they should go hand in hand. Uh, where Janos is showing his two photon microscopy, really fabulous imaging uh, of the kidney and, and lessons that you can learn physiologically from that. And Don Ingber, who runs the Wies Institute at Harvard, is one of the leaders in developing human organ mimetics, so-called organs on chips. And he'll be showing a lot of data uh, about how you can take human cells, either primary cells or derived from inducible pluripotent stem cells, put them into small microfluidic devices and really emulate organ function for drug discovery and for uh, preventing drug toxicity as well. But both are really going to be about advanced imaging techniques uh, and advanced approaches to really interrogating human physiology and animal model physiology. So I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow as well. I would like to talk about another event that happened outside the ASN that I feel is very significant going forward and that was um, a workshop uh, of the Song HD initiative um, where Alison Tong from the University of Sydney who spearheads this process has brought together researchers, regulators, even patients, several patients were flown into San Diego to, to you know reflect on you know the third phase of identifying outcomes for nephrology trials and hemodialysis and it was just a magnificent process. Patients, you know, voicing their perspective on the variety of outcomes that have been condensed into this final set. You know, uh, one important outcome, for example, uh, that both patients and, um, and research and providers have put forward was dialysis adequacy. Uh, but it's very interesting, you really need to deconstruct language, what they 
perceive as dialysis adequacy is completely different from the very technical term that we've gotten to know with you know KT OB etc. And you know one patient put it very nicely. You know dialysis adequacy for me means that dialysis that makes me uh, that brings me into position to wake up in the morning and be myself and lead a fruitful day. And so what this initiative is really trying to do through a lot of qualitative Delphi panel kind of research to condense a core set of outcomes that we can then use in future trial and observational registries. Yeah. So I, I really loved participating in that. Something else I really enjoyed today was watching our award winners, our Lifetime Achievement Award winners, which are always yeah. spectacular, uh, interacting with the kidney stars afterwards, which are the students and residents uh, who have an interest in nephrology who attend this meeting. We have over 200 kidney stars attending, and after the plenary sessions and the award sessions today, uh, Mark Seidel, Roger Wiggins, and Glenn Chertow spent an hour and a half talking with the students, telling them how, they, how their careers evolved the way that they did, answering the students' questions. And, and they, you could just see the, that everything was resonating and they were really impacting in touching on the students. And my sense from, from this year is that the Kidney Stars, the students and residents coming to this meeting are really getting excited about kidney disease and about nephrology. So I think that's very upbeat for our profession. And just watching those interactions today was something I found to be very exciting. One of the other things that I really liked today with part of the Kidney Health Initiative is we did have a project as part of the Late Breaker poster session that came out of the Kidney Health Initiative in one of our projects, and that was identifying novel endpoints for lupus nephritis. And that was a project, and that's a barrier to innovation, is that how do you develop a new therapy within lupus nephritis if you don't have an approved endpoint and you have to go back to the regulators to try and get your endpoint. And we've had trials fail within this space because they don't have an endpoint. And so they pulled together all the different trials, and they had, as part of this poster, this different way in which you can analyze to define a trial that is positive based on pooling of this data. And so now we have a different endpoint for lupus nephritis. And I think that was an important development for future therapies because there are a number of novel therapies that could intervene on lupus nephritis and now we have an endpoint that has been agreed upon and tested and validated within this work group of FDA and academia. Um, and industry, and they had all the players together agree to give their trial data to help this move forward. And I think that's an important thing that was done as part of the Kidney Health Initiative. It's a major step forward because, you know, it, you know that purpose, of course, you know, is very important, but that a byproduct is that all of a sudden all these highly comp uh, compartmentalized databases finally find their way together and actually give a highly granular data set uh, that can then be used not just for the purpose that you just described, but also for other important research activities. Um, you know, we had a similar situation just a couple of, year, a couple of weeks back at the KDGO on Fabrice um, meeting in, in Dublin where the situation is such that there are two Fabri, you know, registries and the two sponsors are very reluctant to allow merger of these two databases. And I think that example in the lupus space really illustrates the importance of being willing to step out of your sandbox and bring together and play with everybody else rather than, you know, try to keep your cards too close to your chest. I went to an interesting session uh, called You Are What You Eat. It was on uh, dietary risk factors for CKD. And there, was, there were studies from the Crick study looking at net acid excretion uh, and its effect on kidney disease progression study in the United States. But then I had a study uh, that was presented from Singapore uh, on how eating red meat causes ESRD. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, Don Wesson at the end gave a, a beautiful lecture uh, sharing some unpublished work that he's been doing on at acid retention, that there's acid retention very early on in chronic kidney disease uh, and new ways to measure that acid retention that aren't reflected in bicarbonate. Really, really fascinating. There was also another interesting study, although it wasn't on diet, on sedentary uh, behavior as a risk factor for CKD.
You have been listening to the ASN Kinney Week 2015 podcast. ASN thanks Opco Renal for its support of this podcast. This podcast is copyrighted by the American Society of Nephrology. All rights reserved. All content in this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be medical advice. This podcast should not be used in a medical emergency or for the diagnosis or treatment of any medical condition. Please consult your doctor or other qualified healthcare provider if you have any questions about any medical condition or before taking any drug, changing your diet, or commencing or discontinuing any course of treatment. Thank you for listening to this podcast of the American Society of Nephrology.